Welcome to Ancient Rome. In this episode, you will be walking along the historic streets of the Roman Forum, which was the heart and soul of the Roman Empire from 800 BC to 400 AD. You will hear about all the temples, basilicas and emperors of Rome in that time. We take you down the main boulevard of the Forum where the emperors would parade with their spoils of faraway victories which always included gold and plants and many exotic animals that no one had ever seen before. We tell you all about the most famous leader of all, Caesar, his life and how he died. Palatine Hill overlooks the Forum area and this is where the emperors built their palaces. So listen as we take you up the seven levels of the imperial ramp with its 35 metre high ceilings to the top of Palatine Hill. We share the views from the top and also the remains of the palaces and their private grounds, including a swimming pool and private arena area. Walk with us as we leave the Forum past Titus's Arch and enter one of the most well-known historic buildings in the world, the Colosseum. We were able to visit the arena floor, which is where all the action happened, and get a great insight into the tunnels, the cells and trapdoors. Spoiler alert, there were 88 of them. Listen as we transport you to those ancient times when the Colosseum was a capacity with 50,000 screaming spectators enjoying the entertainment of the day. You'll want to stay listening to the end to find out exactly what that entertainment was. Actually, you might not call it entertainment. And also what the crowds had barbecued for lunch. And no, it wasn't another shrimp on the barbie. Don't forget, if you want to see all the pictures and find the link to the tour we did in this episode, then go to the podcast player you're listening on now and click the link in the podcast description to episode 66. If you know anyone planning a trip to Italy, then please share our Italian podcast series with them at www.beachtravelwine.com forward slash Italy. Please enjoy episode 66, all about ancient Rome. Cheers and welcome to the Beach Travel Wine podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Leanne. And I'm Lyle, and this is the travel podcast for beach-loving, wine-drinking couples over 50. So if that sounds like you, grab yourself a drink, sit back, relax and listen as we go travelling the world one wine at a time. Cheers. Good morning, Lyle. How are you today? We're back in the podcast studio. Buongiorno, Leonita. <laughs> Uh, as I said in the previous uh, part, when I int- introduction is the word I'm looking for, uh, we're talking all about the history of Rome today, and that includes obviously the Forum and the Palatine Hill and the Colosseum, which is basically right in the heart of Rome. But um, how do we get there? Like it, we're, we, when you're staying in Rome, what's the best place? What's the best way to get to the Forum, which is where we're going to start our tour today? Well, you can either walk. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not far from anywhere really, or there are buses, and there is the metro, and there's a station, metro station basically right at the Colosseum. Oh, I didn't see that. Well, because we were able to walk because, well, it isn't that big a city really, is it? No, um, not at all. We, yeah, so it was about a 20-minute walk walk for us and we met um, our guide. Yeah, Diego. Diego. He was great, wasn't he? Yeah, he was fabulous. Yep. Yeah, I'm not as big into history as you've probably all learnt by now as, as Lyle is, and um, this guy was even dressed um you know differently he had a bright sort of hawaiian shirt on and a cute little hat and he had um oh some sort of chain and flag hanging on his on his um you know thing that we were following around yeah he was he was really enthusiastic and and great but um so the ticket what you know i wanted to see the coliseum that's what i wanted to book so i want you know like that as everyone does but it also included um yeah the yeah so it includes the roman forum the Colosseum and the Palatine Hill. Mm. Now the tickets, uh, that's a, so it's a combination ticket. The tickets for adults are sixteen euro, eighteen to twenty five two euro, and under eighteen they're free. Uh, as far as I know, uh, there's free entry the first Sunday of every month. Uh, you'll need about a three hours minimum to yeah, see minimum. the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that there are no signed. Uh, the, the monuments aren't signed. So at, you'll at least, if you don't do a guided tour, you're going to need a guidebook. Um, we actually booked an online uh, Skip the Line all-inclusive guided tour that included the Coliseum Arena floor access, yeah. and it was about $100 Australian dollars each. Now, the reason I booked this one was because, it, you know, like all the reviews and things, 
if you just do the normal uh, Coliseum tour, you don't get to go out on that um, arena floor and they made that sound pretty impressive as it was. I'm, so I'm glad we did that, yeah? Yeah. So, um, and just, you know, like I didn't know what the um, Roman Forum was. I know that sounds ignorant, but, I, you know, I could see lots of ruins and things, but I, I really had, had no idea and I was just sort of following the guide so I could get to the Coliseum. But there was a lot to learn, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, like it's it's huge. It's um, And the first thing you notice is the forum is well below the current modern street level. Um, uh, Why is that, though? Well, back in the day, the sewerage, sewerage system stopped working after the Roman Empire fell and the area of Rome and Forum, often filled with debris and dirt brought by the river Tiber flooding. So mm. just over, over centuries, the land, uh, uh, the town just got buried mm. under more and more rubbish and they now, dug it out though yeah yeah so but for, can i just say something quickly i mean i know you're going to give me the, the history now um but just for those um lay people that like me just think of it this way the forum is the heart of was the heart of rome it's where yeah, ancient rome ancient rome that's right yeah so when you when Lyle's telling you about the history, I'm going to jump in hopefully and, and just give you some sort of um, you know some of my lay people's um, information just to make it all make a bit more um, visual sense. More um, I had the fluff, don't I? Anyway, yeah. sorry, you go on with your, your history because it's fascinating history, really. Rome was founded on the 21st of April 70, 753 BC. I'm not sure why they had the 21st of April. How <laughs> they knew that, but anyway. The site of the Roman Forum was originally marshland and it was drained using the Cloaca Maxima, one of the world's first sewage systems, and converted into the public meeting place. Now, that particular sewage system, uh, when they got it back working, that's now still being used in modern-day Rome. So that, to me, is incredible. Around the 5th century BC, the space gradually expanded and transformed into the Forum through the construction of important temples such as the Temple of Saturn. It became the centre of public and political life in the city, the site of ceremonies, trials and speeches. So it was like the place where people would gather, you know, like if you didn't have your newspaper of the day but everyone would go down to, to hear what the news was and um, so people from around the outside of the, the city centre would, would go in there, yeah? Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, how I suppose in Western civilization now, you know, you have that city square. Yeah. And so that, you know, the senators, if they wanted to tell the, the population, you know, new laws or what was going on, or anybody could actually get up. Mm. And so, yeah, it was... Probably. Is that maybe that's where the soapbox came from? Maybe yeah, probably. <laughs> um, and yeah, in, in, the, in those days they didn't have newspapers, so no. that's what it was all about. Mm. Um, now the Roman for, uh, Forum was rediscovered in 1803 by the archaeologist Carlo Fia, who started to clean the area and excavate work has been continual ever since. What was he? He was an archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. An archaeologic, uh, oh, I can't, I said it. Archaeologist. Uh, that's the one. An archaeologist. Uh, last, pro- uh, last practice that about 10 times. Yeah. But you got it off anyway. I thought I got it there, and then, but it's archaeological. No, I can't do it. No, but anyway, well, let's move wrong. on, move on. <laughs> um, the forum. And so the reason it was excavated, as Lyle alluded to before, was because, you know, over the years, after it was sort of a, like abandoned in, in a way, um, it it was it got silted up every time Correct. the river flooded, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so the Forum is located at the base of the Capitol Hill and the Palatine Hill. Uh, the the Via Sacra, uh, Sacra is the main street um, that runs directly between the Arch of Titus and the Arch of Septimus Severus. So this is the main drag yeah. of the Roman Forum, right? And it's long and it's straight. And if you walk down and you stand right sort of in the middle which is where we entered you look to your left and there's you know this big long sort of uh paved road i guess with temples and ruins which you're going to tell us about in a minute and a and an arch that you're going to tell us about at one end and then you look to the right and even more so like more columns and and 
you know, uh, temples and things and another arch at the other end. So there's this big, long main street. You actually yeah, get which is VM Sacra. So yep. you actually get the feeling it was important. There's just something about, you know, like the, about being standing there and in that street. I can't well, I think that, remember, I, I, the thing that really impressed me about Diego, he he would say, imagine this. Well, yeah, well, he said something. Can I say that now about like when the Empress came back? Because you're probably going to say that, but I that's one of the things I do remember. He'd say, just stand here and, and imagine that, you know, the Emperor has returned from one of his victories and he's, you know, um, all the town folk, and there was a million of them, you know, like have, yeah, have, yeah. have gathered. At the time of Caesar, yeah, there was a million yeah, population, yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the town of, they've all gathered and, and the emperor in all his, you know, uniforms and his soldiers behind him and he's often got his, you know, his wife with him and and then behind him he's got all the spoils. So, so they've got the big um the gladiator cart things, or no, not the carts, the, what are the wagons, right? So they've, they've got You're the talking wagons. about the chariots. The chariots, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> you reckon I had problems with Lucky archaeology? Uh, still yes, can't I say. did. And so they're, they're all sort of thundering up this, um, the main street, and behind them they've got, you know, all the spoils of war. There's gold and there's they've got all the slaves that they've brought back and they've got all the barrels full of spices and you know the plants they've, they've brought the trees back and 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 plants and flowers and fruits and things they've brought them all back and then they've brought animals there's yeah, giraffes the farm animals. and elephants and this whole parade is making its way down this street and you just can stand and the way diego's explaining it you're just like oh my gosh yeah it's um yeah it was pretty impressive wasn't it that, that main street yeah so and and basically the forum is is almost like a bit of a valley between well it is a valley between the two the, the capitol hill yes and also the palatine hill oh. now the capitol hill basically was um the where the senate building was yes and then at the palatine hill was where the palace uh was yes. and, and be, between both between there you've got the uh the arch of titus yes that's and that's, one end of the... that's at the palatine end and that was to commemorate both the military triumphus Titus and his father Vespian with their victory and in the Jewish wars. Uh, Titus became emperor in 79 AD. He completed construction of the Flavian Amphitheatre, better known as the Colosseum, and opened it with ceremonies lasting 100 days. Yeah, and we've got a whole lot more on the, on the, um, the Colosseum coming up, yes? Yep. As you were saying, at one end there's the Arch of... Titus. Yep. Yeah. And, and at the other end? Yeah, there's the Arch of Septimius Severus. And now that's a white marble triumphant arch. So it's really, they're the same as the Arc de Triomphe. You know, mm. it's whenever they'd have the big battles, they come up with these um, arches. And then it was dedicated in 203 AD to commemorate the pattern. 203 AD. 203. <laughs> what did I say? 2003. Oh, sorry. 2000. We. I did that before. Yeah. In 2003, 203. 203 AD, to commemorate the Pathian victories of the emperor and his two sons after the death of Septimius Severus, his sons, Carasala and Greta, were initially joint emperors. Now, this is the interesting part. Carasala had Greta assassinated in 2012 Greta's memorials were destroyed and all images of mentions of him were removed from the public buildings and monuments. And this this, this sort of stuff used to happen all the, all time. the time. But and, so let me get this straight. This, the, the guy's built an arch after yep. he's been victory and, and he died. So he's this wonderful, you know, emperor that's made, won a war. Severus, yeah. Yep. And, he, and so he dies and before he dies, or like, anyway, he makes his two sons emperors. So, yep. you know, he's built this huge arch. It's still standing. It's one of the one of the only things that's still still really. Yeah, it's you, one of the iconic ones, right? Yeah. And and then the little buggers kill each other. One well, well, kills yeah. each other. One kills the other. Yeah, so, the I'm eldest um, killed his yeah. younger brother. Yeah. And basically removed all evidence that his brother actually existed. But before you move on, um, I actually got some nice photos of the different arches and the Titus arch. Uh, has like some really amazing um, decoration on it, um, and I've, yeah, so I've been up under that and, and got some photos. So that's um, if you go to um, the description in the podcast player that you're listening to now, 
and the the link to podcast uh, um, blog post that, that goes with this is episode 66 the links there um, or just go to um, beattravelwine.com forward slash podcast and, and be episode 66 so there's lots of photos of what we're talking about uh, and you'll, it'll help put the picture together for you now one of the first temples which uh, was the ancient temple of Saturn traditionally dated at 497 BC stands at the foot of Capitol Hill. So mm. it's still there. Mm. It's again, it's one of those um, iconic uh, images. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the pediment and the eight surviving columns represents one of, yeah, yeah. it's just, it's, I, it's, it's one of the first, it's still there. There's the eight columns and it looks fabulous. Yeah, and I've got I've got a nice view of that sort of because we went past sort of at the end of the day as well and I've got some nice photos of that. Yeah, well, that's quite close to the Senate building. Mm. Another temple, the Temple of Castor and Pollux, was originally built in gratitude for a victory at the Battle of the Lake Regillus in 495 BC. Uh, so really they have a battle and they build a temple. Yeah, yeah, if they win the battle, yeah. So they're, they're, they're not shy. Or an arch or a... Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just three columns stand. Legend tells these heroes, the sons of Jupiter and Leda. Now, these are gods, ancient gods. So, you know, it's all about mythology, really. Yeah. Appeared on the spot to help the forces of the Roman Republic. Mm. So uh, to overcome the last king of Rome. So now, I've got a really nice photo of those three columns. They sort of are just standing there sort of majestically on their own it's it's quite a even though it's not much of the temple left what's standing there is is um stately i would say i just yeah um, yeah and and basically yeah. right next to them mm. uh towards the capitol hill you'll see the curia julia which is the senate house and that was ordered by to be built by or julius caesar Buildings works were interrupted by his assassination. Well, that'll do it every time. Yeah. Uh, look, and that was the meeting place for the Senate, undoubtedly one of the most important political buildings in Rome. So at this stage where, where as, you, as you're facing sort of Capitol Hill and Palatine Hill, you know, you, that, this is all down to, to the right towards the, um, away from the Colosseum. This is the, the area you're talking about down there. And, um, you know, you can imagine these, you know, the Senate, members all wandering down there towards that big Senate building uh, past these temples on the way, which is down near the, that, that second arch, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah really, um, it, yeah, you can imagine the town as it was, the city as it was back then, with, even with the, the ruins that are there. Yeah, and then um, just near there's, there's also the, the original basilica. Now, the basilica... In Roman times, it wasn't the like the church. Church, no. No, what they did, the church actually took the name Basilica for the churches from ancient Rome. Yes. The Basilica actually was the courthouse. So they've got ruins of, of that. Uh, to uh, And then the next thing you see is the Temple of Caesar. Yeah, that's true. Um, it was begun by Augustus Octavia, which it was his adopted son. In 42 BC, the Senate worship Julius Caesar posthumously so you know even so though they, died, they yeah started. even though they were uh, conspirators in his, in his death, death. Yeah. Um, now Augustus dedicated the temple to Caesar on August 18 29 BC after the Battle of Actium it stands on the east side of the main square on the site of Julius Caesar's cremation only the remnants of a cement core and podium of the temple of Caesar remains. The temple of Caesar was largely dismantled in the 15th century. Yeah, that is a little bit disappointing. You know, you sort of imagine that the um, the um, temple of Caesar will be you know, something impressive, but, yeah, it, there's not much. Someone's obviously pulled it apart. But people still go there and lay flowers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true, yeah. yeah so, today, yeah. Um, so you've sort of... Now, we're at this stage where we can either keep on going along and, and describing the forum or we thought it, well, I thought it was best that we now talk <laughs> about the life of Caesar. Okay, give it to us. The life of Julius Caesar. Well, you've got to... He's one of the most famous sort of Roman emperors, right? Well, he's probably one of the most famous men ever in okay. history. And I, and I mean, and you can't really um, describe the forum without talking about the life of uh, Julius Caesar. 
Uh, look, when he was uh, the reigning the reigning ruler, there was a population as land set of about a million people. And to put that in perspective, I said I wasn't going to say anything, sorry. To put that in, in perspective, you know, like most of the other big cities of, of the world, you know, like or around only had like about 100 or 150,000, you know. So, you know, when people came into the forum, you know, like to Rome, they just couldn't believe, you know, how powerful they must be with all these people, yeah? Yeah, look, he, he, was, uh, he was a bit of a gambler. Uh, mm. He owed a lot of money. He borrowed to fund election campaigns to stage Olympic-type games and dole out free grain and other typical expenses uh, of candidates and office holders. Uh, now, I could say something very political there. Like what's that? Won't. Well, who gives out money for games and things and then they're getting debt? Hmm? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah. We on. won't. Yeah, we'll move on. <laughs> now, um, because he owes so much money, he needed someone basically to sponsor him. And the guy that sponsored him was the richest man in Rome. So sponsor, as in you know, lending money. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now his name was Marcus Crassus, one of the wealthiest and politically influential men in Rome. Mm. Um, now, they say that Julius Caesar had to continue to conquer so that he could pay his debts. Right, so he had to go off and get gold and keep the slaves and, yeah, you well, know, yeah, and one of them, plants and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah okay. so one of the main, you know, uh, I mm -hmm. suppose um, income was the buying and selling of slaves. Now, uh, Julius Caesar began his rise to power in 60 BC by forcing an alliance with another general, Pompey, and the wealthy Crassus. So if you're anything like me, you're like, oh, Pompey, wasn't that a place? Oh, yeah, but it's, it was a person first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we were here. Well, but at that stage, both um, Julius Caesar and Pompey were generals. Mm -hmm. Now, I see, just didn't know Pompey was a person. Okay, just saying. Now I, I, think, I think actually his real name is Pompey, Pompeius, Pompeius, okay. but they shot it down to... Or well, they westernised it by Pompeii. Together, the three men assumed control of the Roman Republic, and Caesar was thrust into the position of consul. Now, before there was the Republic, the um, sorry, when it was a Republic before it became an empire, the there was two consuls of Rome. Um, so Caesar. Well, yeah, yeah, Caesar and someone else. Now. They actually controlled Rome. Right. Now there was always two consuls, right. and each consul could actually veto the other consul. Okay. And they were only consuls for a year, and they were voted in by the Senate. Mm. So, really, yeah, Caesar's first real power uh, was when he became consul. Okay, so obviously that was pretty cool for him. After Yeah, well, after Crassus's death, Caesar and Pompey remained allies for a few years. Pompey, however, moved to form alliances to counterbalance Caesar's influence. Mm. So they're starting to have a fallout, you know, because yeah. Crassus is gone. Uh, the deteriorating trust mm. through 50 BC pushed Caesar into an open rebellion in January 49 BC. In other words... They went civil war. Yeah. So okay. basically Julius Caesar against Pompey. Mm. This used to there and there was a previous civil war earlier, and this is really how most emperors were actually uh, decided in the future was through these wars. Okay. Now um, he took control mm -hmm. of the Roman Empire under the first triumphant, eventually assuming dictatorship in 46 BC, mm. he held this position until his assassination in 44 BC. And that wasn't long, was it? Four, no, it was a couple, couple of years. years. <laughs> yeah, and, and basically what it was was, a, you know, the Senate and probably influential people. They, decided he was too powerful. He decided he was too powerful, so they had to get rid of him. Right. Now, yeah. his son, yeah. or actually his stepson, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, and this is where the other thing you've got to understand about the Roman Empire. If Julius Caesar, he had a daughter, but he didn't have any sons. So to keep power and with their dynasty, 
they would adopt children. Mm -hmm. And um, Caesar's heir, Octavian, uh, and Lieutenant Mark Antony defeated Caesar's, Caesar's assassins yeah. in 42 BC. Yeah. So but they, they finally split. Yeah. Antony's defeat alongside his ally and lover, Cleopatra, at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC and the Senate's grant of extraordinary power to Octavian as Augustan in 27 BC, which effectively made him the first Roman emperor mark the end of the republic so you've got to understand that caesar actually technically was never an emperor right no okay he was a dictator but his son through the power of the senate became the first emperor right okay um okay. now so uh now how were the emperors now so all of a sudden the republic's finished mm -hmm. we're going into the imperial rome now how are these emperors chosen that was I that was my next question okay so there was really four ways there was the hereditary rule yes which of is Sir. Octavian yeah or um, fighting amongst private army armies oh so soldiers In, yeah soldiers <laughs> basically and and actually the soldiers if if there was a big victory the soldiers actually would vote that they're the, generally their the general was the new emperor so there was at times mm. more than one emperor of rome oh okay and then there was or you were invested with the imperial title by the senate or both of those mm -hmm. now when the, th the thing that really confused me about this is mm. when you you go through and you're reading through all the emperors and all this sort of stuff mm. they they all had the name caesar Mm. Well, most of them had the name Caesar, and they also had the name Augustus. Right, and, I, and it just confused me. So I went in and I had a look at it. Mm. When an emperor or Augustus, so Augustus actually is a title of emperor. Right. So, but they're basically the same thing. Named an heir to the throne, that heir would be known as Caesar. Mm -hmm. Okay, until his accession when he would take the title of Augustus. Okay. So that's how that worked. Uh, now, what did, what actually caused the Rome to fall? Well, that, once again, was my next question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, but, yeah, good. Um, you go. I was wondering that. Okay, so basically it was corrupt. Because it was pretty, you know, like they had a million people and they had all this wealth and, and you know, but once again the leaders can't help themselves. There's always corruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, there was corruption locally. And then everyone wanted power, so, you know, they're di dividing the the empire up, I guess. Well, and also the fact that the empire was so big. Yes. So So you had what would happen is that the, 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 sen or the emperors would send governors out to, you know, for instance, Spain mm. or France, or what was called Gaul in those days. You know, and the governors were responsible for collecting taxes. Oh, and who's going to know if they get them? Yeah. So yeah, so you can see that what the problem is going yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah. The the and and I guess if they got weaker, then they are open to invasion by other people. Too. Well, the people the people in these uh, provinces, yeah, they were getting pissed off that yeah. they were getting ripped off by the governors mm. because the governors the only way they made money was basically by overtaxing. You know, yeah. so so they so mm. all of a sudden, all these provinces started attacking mm. um, each other, and then yeah, and then all of a sudden there was also the invasion by the Germanic Germanic tribes. Mm. So the last emperor was Romulus Augustus. Mm. He was only an adolescent when he became emperor and was deposed from the throne in four seventy six A.D. by Odoacer. A leader of a Germanic tribe. Now, at that stage, there was only eighty to a hundred thousand people yeah. in uh, Rome. Uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, which marked the beginning of the Middle Ages, Rome slowly fell under the control of the papacy. Papacy, so that the, the that's the Roman Catholic, Roman Church. Catholic Church. Yeah. And in the eighth century, it became capital of the papal stage which lasted until 1870. So that was 1,114 years under as a papal state. So let's keep moving through the Roman Forum. Yep. Um, so we've gone past Caesar's temple um, yeah. 
and we go to now the house of the Vestal Virgins, right? Correct. It was big, yeah. Yeah, like, and the priestesses who these were the Vestal Virgins were the priestesses who took the vow of chastity and tended the sacred flame of the goddess of Vesta. Now, again, through mythology and uh, it basically came down to the, the, the Vestal Virgins and they had to remain chaste for 30 years and they were not allowed to let the flame go out because the when if the flame went out, it basically was the start of bad luck. Oh, so that must have happened about the end fall of the empire what 476 ad did you say i'd say that uh, maybe all the candles went out right then yeah. went right then and there but okay. you can you can actually walk through the um yeah. the house yeah. of the vestals yeah um and then like once we once we saw that uh we moved towards the palatine end yeah well the palatine hill um you know so as we we're saying you know you've got the, the main street and you've got it, the temples and the basilicas and and the this house here and it's you know, it's it's all pretty narrow this this area, um, but it all sits at the bottom of um, the or the, the one end of it sits at the bottom of Palatine Hill, right? Yeah, and that's basically where after a while emperors started building their palaces. Correct, yeah, correct. Yeah. So, look, one of the probably the last thing you actually see is uh, called the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine. This was bloody huge. Oh, yes. Uh, so the vast structure was constructed in 312 AD. It was the largest building in Rome and was used as a courthouse and meeting hall. The basilica stood on a 100 by 65 metre concrete rectangular platform for our American listeners, 328 feet by 213 feet. The central nave was 80 metres long, 25 metres wide and 30 five meters high now diego our guide this was his favorite thing place mm. like he he was just blown away has always been blown away by the the absolute size of this place now you don't it's obviously not the full building but it's got it was it had three big um arches in it or not arches domes ceilings mm, you yeah. know like and those ceilings were decorated in like these ock octagon sort of shapes like great big octagons and they somehow they were held up there um and you can see them still up there but there is one on the ground and the size of this thing is like massive and yeah you've got to wonder how they built them the, yeah the vastness and that's what diego was going on about and and yeah so that's when you're at the bottom of palatine hill looking across the forum and that's on the other side it is just amazing and we actually got to walk through that before we headed off out of the out out of this area um and yeah you you think it's big when you're standing back looking at it but when you're there underneath this 80 meter high you know ceiling it's pretty amazing wasn't it? yeah so that was a courthouse yeah. and and, yeah. and and what led me then to think well you know what was roman law about and there was four main pillars of roman law and the pillars were equal treatment under the law innocent until proven guilty the burden of proof proof is on the accuser unfair laws can be disregarded mm. so pretty much like basically yeah. common law today mm. so yeah, um pretty cool and yeah so yeah as land said that was the the building was so big and mm. so huge mm. um and again you know that symbolism of power i think just the size of the buildings and Look, as much as, you know, um, I feel like apologising to go because we've done the history of the buildings, but I think you can't just describe the building without talking about the yeah. understanding it. So yeah. now the next thing we did, hmm. and this was only discovered in 1900, was the Imperial Ranch. Yes. And now, once again, Diego said most of the tour guides don't take you on the Imperial Ramp. And I don't know why, but it's a little bit out of the way. But... I've got some really great photos of, of this ramp and it's, oh, well, do you describe it? Like yeah, okay. The, the, the seven-level ramp was yeah. built by Emperor Domitian in the first century AD to serve as a majestic entry from the Forum to the Imperial Palace. It's actually the, 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 the walls are 35 metres high. Yeah. It is huge. And, and there are 150, in other words, 115 feet. 
once at the top of the of, of the ramps, mm. tell me about the views. Well, we, yes, I will. But I'm just trying to, you know, like make sure people understand. It's not just like a, a ramp to walk up. It's and, and it's covered. It's a big archway, you know, like it's a big covered seven tier. Was it? Did you say like you go up, seven levels? Seven yeah. levels. So you go. It was for their horses to yeah, go. Exactly. That's it. So, you know, you're on your chariot or your. Well, that's the right word. That's the word, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chariot, Wagon. not the car. No. <laughs> yeah. And, and and it takes you all the way up these seven levels as you sort of um, wind your way around and the the um, the huge big ceiling that, that covers it and there's some little windows, you know, along the way as well. And, you know, so they would have gone up there centuries ago and then when you get to the top of um, Palatine Hill, as Lyle said, the, there's a big um, viewing platform, I guess you'd call it, and you um, there's a few different levels. So the first one we sort of stopped at basically gives you a view back down over the whole forum, and I've got a, a fabulous photo of that, and you get a bit more of a perspective of the streets and the layout of it, and and of course over to the big you know basilica that you were talking about a minute ago, and then if you go up further around the other side you basically have 360 degree views of the city of Rome. So you have the Forum and, of course, then you've got the Colosseum in the distance and then, you know, you've got all the way around. We well, can actually see across to the St Peter's Basilica. Yeah, the modern, yeah, exactly. I was going to say modern. That's not really modern. But the rest of Rome, that's right. So it's probably the best views, you know, one of the places because it, it, it's all the way around, yeah. Well, what you've got to understand is that the, 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 the palace, mm. uh, the Palatine Palace, um, it was the start of the, uh, and it was built in 27 BC or yeah. started by Augustus. Um, and over time, it eventually, you know, was pulled down and another yes. emperor had built another one and another one, an emperor had built another one. And they all became more and more elaborate. But elaborate. It's mostly ruins. Up, up oh, now it now. is. Now yes. it is. But yeah. the main thing you see is actually the ruins of the palace um, of uh, Dimitina. Yeah. Uh, okay. I didn't say that right. Dimitian. Um, now, originally, yeah, as I said, Augustus uh, uh, Caesar's uh, adopted son, he yeah. built the first one. He also built um, the Temple of Apollo between 36 and, and 28 BC. Uh, and he was the god of oracle, mm -hmm. hearing, and the young. The temple was damaged in the Great Fire of 64, but restored by Domitian before its final destruction in 363 AD. Only partial remains survived. So can uh, we talk about the stadium and the swimming pool and the gardens? Are we, um, can I tell people about how beautiful they were? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, like obviously, you know, there's different emperors building different palaces and they're getting bigger and bigger. But they had um, uh, a whole stadium that they had set up uh, um, for their private use. Yeah, and they call that the Hippodrome. Okay. And, you know, obviously they had people competing in there and, you know, and, and I've got some fabulous photos of that because it's this big oval and you can see the... Um, the private viewing box on one side and um, and then, you know, like the, the tiered seats on another. That That's amazing. And, or, you know, like stadium, I guess, private arena is what yep. you call it. They all, you know, they had a swimming pool. Yeah. So can you imagine that? Like how many centuries ago they actually, you know, had, had, a, had a swimming pool? <laughs> and then um, Rose Gardens? Yes, yes, that and, was... Uh... I, they were they were established not in Rome. They were established in 1537 by yeah. Cardinal Farnese. Began a program of building and ex excavating on the Palatine. But One of the remaining projects from this era yes. still visible are the rose gardens. And you know how I like a garden. And there's some not just rose roses in there though. There's some beautiful trees and things. And that's sort of in the middle at the flat bit on top of the hill. And you, this hill wasn't always flat. You know, they, they flattened it out to build their um, their palaces and stuff on it. Um, and some fountains, you know, I remember um, Diego telling us about the, the marble and stuff in the fountains. Yeah, and yeah. there are structures that are the bases of fountains, um, some with intact coloured marble yeah, flooring. Yeah, still there. Uh, Another with an octagonal shape. Yeah. So, and they're sort of up, you know, like 
it's a it's a big area. It's a bit hard to explain. It's on top of a hill. There's, there's sort of ruins of palaces, and then they've got the stadium and the pools and the and the fountains and the gardens. It's like a you know like a big palace sort of um, what would you call it enclosure? Yeah, look, yeah. look it was. Uh, I think the size of it was yeah. 131 acres or 53 hectares. So it was huge. Yeah, it was big, yeah. yeah. And you've also got near the House of Augustus is located near the so-called Hut of Romulus and the House of Livia, who was the wife of Augustus. Now, yeah. the, uh, the, yeah. the, so the Hut of Romulus. Yes. Um, now, you, I remember we, we saw the, the image of Rome is actually... One of the images of, one of Rome, the Rome football team too. Yeah. Is the oh, yes. she-wolf. Yeah. Uh, with the Romulus and Remus. Two babies underneath. Yeah. Um, so the story was that she found them? Yeah, she found them. Well, and where she found them Or where was, she looked after them or brought them, whatever she did, was there. Yeah, it was the hut of Rom- Romulus. Yeah, fascinating. So, yeah, yeah, so it's you know, full of mythology. It is. When you leave the Palatine Hill with all those beautiful ruins and fountains and pools and, you know, gardens and things, uh, you, we went down a path back down towards the Forum and it's probably one of the, the highlights of my, the, the day for me was we sort of walk around uh, this area and you've got to imagine there's, there's a lot of people walking around the Forum and, and not as many up on Palatine Hill but a lot down the Forum and then all of a sudden we're in this sort of place where there's just our tour group, which wasn't that many, and Diego, and we're on a, on a path and you look out and there's the Colosseum. And it's sort of, I mean, we'd seen it walking up to the um, the tour. But you can imagine that then, you know, you're in the garden area, like downstairs, and they used to grow, um, you know, lemons and things, you know, had the orchards and stuff. So it was sort of the, the view that I guess the people would have had of the Colosseum when they're leaving the Forum heading towards the Colosseum, yeah? I, that, that just sort of stuck with me that um, I've got some beautiful photos of that view. There's like a, a trees around it and stuff. It was, yeah, sort of very um, memorable for me. Uh, and then we did a, we had a short walk where we walked through the big um, basilica that we talked about and headed out a, a gate. I remember there was some... Well, there was another arch. Yeah, down there. down Yeah, it's like the Arc de Triomphe down mm. the bottom. Um, we remember there were people trying to get in the gate. Like people just are so... You know, like it was locked and they're just they're trying to find a way around. I'm like, no, you got to walk all the way around. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. So we're, we're walking down and we go past another big arch, yes, and we arrive at the the Colosseum. And everyone knows the Colosseum. We don't need to really describe it. However, we, we will. Um, the Colosseum is, uh, it, can I tell you this story though first? When we got there, um, we had the skip the line tickets and skip the line's a bit of a furphy because there's everybody with skip the line tickets. But we followed Diego, you know, around and it, like, it was like we we're going around, around the Mulberry bush, but we, we finally got to where our entrance was to go onto the arena floor. And the, um, Diego says, um, he's chatting away and I'm wandering around taking photos. Do you do remember this? Uh-huh. And, um, and I said to him, um, Diego, how long did it take to build? Do you remember what he said to me? I've told you this several times, <laughs> he but, said, but I will tell you again. Yeah, I'll tell you one more time, you know. And so I was like, okay, sorry, I got in, I got in a bit of trouble. It took nine years. Yeah, from seventy-two AD to mm. late eighty AD. And and he said they worked day and night. Yep. Yeah, on it. So this was like the entertainment center, wasn't it? Yeah, like yeah. The, well, they had the gladiator shows. Yes, well, yeah, um, talk about and, those. Um, yeah, they took place at the Colosseum, and the and the spectators basically saw the fights as entertainment. Right. So, the the Colosseum ha, has eighty arches around on three levels. So that's over two hundred and forty arches. And when you think of the Colosseum, that's what you, what you see. Um, it had five rings, and you start at the outside and you you go in, but. Um, Half of those, um, no, I think there's on one side's intact still with those those five rings, but the other side there's only three because of an earthquake. Yeah. Yeah. That. Uh, mm. Yeah. The earthquake was in 1349, yeah. and it basically split the facade. Yeah. So 
and that's you know once again that iconic picture where you see you know like the the, the all the levels and then you, you you've got the arches and then the the only part of it but you can still walk around all the way inside of it now the coliseum um is obviously people know it because of the gladiators yeah right but originally um it was full of water so the the arena floor wasn't it or it wasn't arena floor was it yeah 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 and because they they used to reenact naval battles yeah yeah which there's somewhere else another arena in um milan yeah, that's right. Of, yeah, that's right. So that 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 was um that was quite um yeah normal, I guess. But what they did was they on the outside of the arches they had numbers. Yep. And so, and turnstiles, ancient turnstiles. Yeah. So it's no, there was no different than going to a modern modern football stadium where they had the number <laughs> on the on the gate. Yeah, but there were eighty of them. There so was eighty got, gates, and, and they could fit fifty thousand people. Right. So you can, if they all got in, they were apparently really quick and and out you know really quick like that that was the logistics were good but you had to have a ticket mm. as well and apparently you got a ticket you know like you couldn't just buy a ticket you got given a ticket by the you know by the nobles or the politicians at the time you know and they they were just like i guess it was like the the what do they call it today the boxes where you go like the the sponsors boxes yeah yeah <laughs> you know you get modern the, b- b- bribery basically <laughs> there we go there we go um but when the um uh the coliseum was drained it then became um, like uh, they obviously they put a floor over the, the top and underneath that floor was all the um, little streets and little rooms and corridors and stuff. Tunnels. Uh, tunnels. There That's we go. the word. Um, and above those tunnels were, was it eight, 88 um, trapdoors mm. in the arena floor? So, and each one of those trapdoors had. Um, an elevator that was operated by eight slaves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lift basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what this was, as you said, it was entertainment. So what used to happen was um, the activities would go all day. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Are you with me? Yeah. Yes? And they would start with, um, you know, like the the sort of least entertaining. I guess it's a bit like going to an outdoor concert. Yeah, they have the least <laughs> impressive artist on first, yeah? And well, I think that was also, I think part of that was the execution. Oh, oh yes. They, yeah, okay, they did that. <laughs> and, you know, they, they had like normal like performers as well and then ended with the highlight of the day was the gladiators. Yeah, and the gladiators were basically slaves. Mm. Um, and But they didn't want them to die. No, because, you know, everybody thinks, you know, you just have the thumbs up and the thumbs down. That's the typical um, mm. movie thing. But basically... The, the the guys that promoted the events and actually trained the gladiators, they didn't want to see their investments killed needlessly. Mm. So and sometimes that, they did have to beg for their lives, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Now, the glad okay, there's one thing I'm going to admit. I had not watched the movie Gladiator. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm ashamed to say that now because I think my, my sons, at least, had watched it I don't know how many times um, and I you know, obviously didn't do it. And, you know, my, my daughter just shook her head and was just like, you know, like, well, because I was saying to her, saying to them, did you know that, you know, the gladiators did this and this happened and they're like, they looked at me with these looks on their faces as if to say, yes, you do, mum, because that's basically what the gladiator movie is about. So after we'd left the Coliseum, I sprinted home, like literally, didn't I? Just, you know, put the backpack on and sprinted home to watch the gladiator. And I really loved it. Yeah, and basically the, the the story itself is based on you know the history, the time and history. Yeah. And the guy um, it was Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius in the movie was the the last of the emperor, mm. and it um, made or well, suggested that Commodus, his son, his son actually killed him. That's not true. No, but uh, okay. it was true that Commodus did uh, perform as a gladiator mm. and uh, when Maximus, which was uh, Russell Crowe, Russell Crow, killed Commodus in the um, arena, that wasn't true. But uh, That's a good story, Lyle. Oh, yeah, but but the, the thing about um, Mark Aurelius' really son, he was very, very narcissistic. Mm. He was a good-looking guy. Um, and <laughs> so, yeah, so it was 
sort of based around well, I found the true it story. Yeah. Now I know you've got some information about um, the Colosseum, and then I want to come back to the um, the elevators and the trap doors and what actually happened. What, what what Diego told us about it. So it had a had a retractable roof, didn't it? Yeah, the the Colosseum had a retractable roof. On hot days, an awning called a valerium was unfilled above the upper deck to shade spectators from the sun. Now, interestingly, the upper deck, the uh, four levels, the, right? Yeah, the fourth level. Uh, the, uh, the the ladies that attended, uh, they had to go to the fourth level, yeah. so the highest level. And those st- those stairs weren't um, weren't uh, easy to get up. They no, were... they were really ragged. You know, it was almost and like steep. yeah, it was almost like. Um, Cinque Terre, yeah. you know, the, the, yeah. the hike we did so there. The women well, were actually, on, they were worse. So The women were on top, uh, yeah. the top level, and the nobles were at the bottom yeah. and everyone else was in between. Yeah, so now these uh, valeriums, they were operated by sailors from the Roman Navy and who were stationed around the top of the Colosseum. Now, we know that this retractable roof exists because Diego showed us the coins that were minted at the time that actually showed the sales. I was fascinated with the stories Diego told us about the entertainment inside the Coliseum. I don't know what I thought went on in there, to be honest, but... I'm not sure what you thought went on there either. But some of the stuff he told us. Now, picture this. You've got um, the... um, What's underneath the arena floor? The tunnels, and there's little rooms down there. Yeah, right? they called it the the tunnels were called the hyper gym. Okay. The hyper gym. Yeah. Okay. So that that that's underneath the floor, and there's 88 trap doors. Now, as I've mentioned before, each trap door has an elevator, which is like a, a intricate sort of pulley system, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah. Now, at any time, there could be one. Well, not one, that'd be boring, but there could be, you know, two, 20, all 88 trap doors could open. You didn't know what was going to come out. Now, out of those trap doors would be um, prisoners and slaves. Yep. And wild animals. Correct. Right? That And depending on, I mean, obviously it's fight to the death. So you could have, you know, a lion and two prisoners. You could have, you know, a wild bear or what. what it was just horrendous, right? Well, and you've also got the gladiators. Yeah, yeah. but that's that was later. Yeah, I'm talking about like that. The gladiators didn't fight with the beasts, did they? Yeah. They did. Okay. Well, but what happened was they so they'd fight to the death. So you'd have before the gladiators because this was like the gladiators were the last entertainment of the day. So this was sort of midday, I imagine, when everybody's you know wanting a bit more you know gore to, in their day, and one and once they fought to death. So what happened? The if a prisoner got killed, right, mm. they would cut that prisoner up and feed it to the animals waiting downstairs. Correct. Right? But if an animal got killed, they would cut that animal up. And barbecue it and feed it to the spectators. <laughs> true, st- true story. Oh, my gosh. I couldn't believe that. But when you think about it, it makes sense. Oh, yeah, well, Instead right. of having like a, a T-bone steak, you had a T-bone line, you know. But they also had things like they would catapult prisoners across the arena. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or they, I, I don't, they nailed them to a cross, sometimes upside down. Like it was dreadful, you know. And as you said, public executions, you know, like, and people are cheering on. And, and then, of course, after that, um, the highlight of the day was the gladiator fights, as you said, and they're highly trained, you know. Uh, but most of those were slaves. So, and you could, I think, if you won a certain amount of yeah, you could get um, out um, gladiator fights. Yes, uh, you could gain your freedom. But the most famous, famous, famous gladiator was a a Greek guy called Spartacus, oh. and he actually led a slave rebellion. Did he? Yes, he did. I knew you didn't know that. I just thought I'd throw that in at the end. <laughs> so that that's, you know, so we're finding out all this as you're looking down over the tunnels and the trap doors. There's a trap door left there. And um, and then from there you're looking up around the the seats of the Colosseum and, you you know, like, I mean, obviously you can't imagine what it would be like, but it would be it would have been terrifying. And there's just, as you said, was it 40,000 or 50,000 people 
on these different levels all you know like cheering and it be a bit like you know a, a football match today obviously but um just and then Diego what were you gonna say well I just you're saying how it looked like the two most prominent movies I can think of um of the gladiator fights was there was one called Ben Hur right and that was back in I think in the That's 50s random, and right? that was a uh, <laughs> And it was about a, a famous chariot race. Okay, yeah. And uh, and it was about, and there was another one called Spartacus. Yes, and also and, Gladiator. And also Gladiator. And, you know, to, to, to be honest, after watching those movies, it's so easy to standing imagine. in the actual Colosseum yeah. and imagining what would happen. But I think the, the also inside on the tour, you know, because you get, um, Diego, there's a, obviously like a display where they have um, models of what it was like, you know, fully built and, and they show the intricate um, workings of the, the pulley system. Yeah, the yep. pulley system. So there's a lot of um, that sort of uh, tourist information stuff, which is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I think. And, and I certainly would recommend doing the tour with the arena floor because that's where you get the whole experience of, of, of the Colosseum, I think. Yeah, well, you look up into the stands mm. and you can just imagine it, yeah. uh, how it would have been. And if you can also see the difference from the outside. There was a, um, a wealthy guy paid, and I don't know how long it took to, to get the outside of it cleaned. And, yep. and obviously money ran out or time ran out because, you know, that was on the outside ring. The further you come inside, the 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 more not dirt but grime is covered. But you know, this is a building that's been standing, you know, for centuries. Yeah, you know, centuries. Yeah. And just centuries. explain mm. the 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 what you mean by the rings. Um. So there's five rings. Yeah. So yes. it's basically they're corridors. Yeah. So yeah, five. So that's right. So the outside and and the earthquake that happened um, knocked half of the two of the rings out. So on one side, there's only three rings. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, as I understand, I don't, I don't know how true this is, but because of the intricacy of the rings yes. yeah, as the corridors and the 80 arches to get in, they something like those 50,000 spectators could be exited within like 30 minutes. And back in the day too, this is something else that um, Diego said, above the arches there's like where they used to put rods. And I didn't know what he's talking about, but he's talking about flags. So the oh. whole thing... You know, it had um, you know, had the turnstiles. It had the gates. It had the fifty thousand people with their tickets. It, you know, the, there's all this entertainment going on, and the roofs on, and there's it's like a carnival atmosphere. And you know, every um, arch has got a flag. You know, yeah, a, there's lots of pandantry, and, and yeah. the same. You know, similar to when they come back after victories and they come through the arches. Yeah. There was all this pageantry, and it was all based, I think, symbolically to represent the emperors as being all powerful and I, and I think the fact that you know the emperor that the that Titus that built the the Colosseum was all a big propaganda well it took nine years didn't it but, well and, nine and, years isn't long no and a hundred days they partied when it opened yeah that's right yeah so yeah, yeah. Days so he liked the party as well so and it was them. always obviously to keep the citizens of Rome happy yeah. and happy with him as the emperor. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I find it intriguing. I love the whole thing, and I probably should apologise from uh, my um, oh, well. obsession with it all. But I and and, and I got really quite um, yes. interested in this because I listened to a couple of podcasts, yeah. which a guy by the name of uh, Dan Khan, yep. Hardcore History. And he's done lots of uh, podcasts on the history of Rome, and also another guy, Daniele Bacelli, and he has his podcast is called History and Fire, and he's done a couple of um, podcasts on Rome and Caravaggio. Yes, well, and you do love your history, but you know that's okay. I um I was able to put my stories to it, and um and I I enjoyed the experience as well. So. I hope you've enjoyed our um, podcast history lesson and, you know, we've wandered the streets with us and, and learnt something about the history of Rome. Cause I of ancient Rome. Of ancient Rome and because I, I, I certainly, certainly did. And another quick sort of hint for you, I would recommend going back at the end of the day as the sun's setting. Oh, yeah, we did and, that. And 
you you just get a completely di- a different perspective. And I've got some photos of when we did that. So, um, so if you want to, you know, like there's lots of photos as you can imagine. Just I don't know, so many of of the um, the, pa- the Palatine Hill and the Forum and the Colosseum. Uh, go to um, our, the podcast player on now and the description there will have a link to podcast episode 66 um, the show notes and that's where all the pictures are and there's also a um, a interactive map you can have a look at to see we're all what we're talking about or just go to beachtravelwine.com and you know you can find all our stuff there and of course we're on instagram as well and if you know someone planning a trip to italy please share our podcast with them because they need to know to get this tour because I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Should we ask for reviews? Yeah, you can ask for reviews. Off you go. Yeah, well, they say that um, the the, uh, the more reviews you get, the more, what's the word? Um, I don't know. Um, authority you show in the podcast yeah, apps? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what Lyle's saying is we would love it if you would go to the podcast app you're listening on now and leave us a, a, re- a five-star review would be wonderful, yes? Yes, nothing <laughs> less. <laughs> <laughs> why would they oh exactly all right we didn't have a wine at the coliseum did we no no we didn't mm. uh, no but there are lots of lots of restaurants overlooking the coliseum that we that you could certainly go and enjoy a wine well yes. we did have a wine at the second biggest coliseum in the world did we yeah that was at verano oh, and we that's... went and saw oh, you're waffling now <laughs> albano. Are... Albano. albano there are lots of restaurants um that so like around the Colosseum where you can certainly look and especially at night go and have dinner and look at the Colosseum anyway thank you for joining us on episode 66 and we'll see you next time so it's goodbye from me arrivederci from me mm-hmm.